Hi, I'm Adam Summer. You're listening to the Yershami Talk podcast with the support of the Yeshivat Devar Yushalayim in Harnof, Jerusalem. This is Kalayim chapter 1, Halakha 6. Now, we've been dealing with the crossbreeding of plants. Now we're getting into the crossbreeding of animals. You can find this in 4A2 in the Art Scroll. Now, the Mishnah starts out, it says, the wolf and the dog. Then it says, the village dog and the fox. What is going to be the village dog? There's some maloket among the Roshonim on exactly what that is. And the Rashi, in his commentary in the Baba Kama Bavli ADA, is going to say that it's similar to a fox and it's a small dog raised by villagers. Uh, the Rosh Cirilio is going to be uh, agreeing with the Rambam about that. It's a type of hunting dog. And then you have a uh, the Aruch is going to be saying it's a small dog that barks at night in deserted areas near villages. And then there's another interpretation that the village dog actually is going to be the name of a dog from a place called Kufrian. In other words, that uh, when it's using the... the uh, the, the small village dog named Kufri, that's what the that's what the Mishnah says. That's actually referring to a type of species from a dog in a place. So the village dog and the fox. Then it says the goat and the gazelle. Now the Rambam is going to be translating uh, this not as gazelle but as a svi, which is going to be a deer. And by the way, the Tosafot is going to be agreeing with that in Hulin 59b. But the Rashi doesn't accept that. He's going to be saying that uh, the Sfi does not have these branched horns where a deer will have these branched uh, horns like antlers. And uh, so that it's really talking about a gazelle. Um, then you have the ibex and the ewe. The ewe is going to be, by the way, a female sheep. And although the mission is talking about uh, the male ibex and the female sheep, the prohibition would also apply to the female ibex and the male sheep. Again, we're talking about crossbreeding. So we're talking about a male ibex with a female sheep. And then it says the horse and the mule. And then it says the mule and the donkey. And then it says the donkey and the wild donkey. Now, what is going to be the wild donkey? And the Rambam is going to be saying that it's something that's found in the desert. So in other words... It's going to be, um, by the way, Kalei Zerayim, which goes over all and tries to identify all these. It's going to identify the wild donkey here as the Onager, which is going to be the Equus uh, Hemoinus. Uh, anyway, so there's apparently out there a, uh, a type of donkey that lives over in the desert. And then it says, although they are similar to each other, they are Kalaim with each other. Now, this is a, a big deal here. I mean, all of this is a very big deal. Why, why do you say this is a big deal? And I'll tell you why it's a big deal. Because one day we'll get a Beth Dash back, right? You have out in the Jerusalem forest, you have wild goats, right? You have a species that has been there for a very long time. And you even have um, wild types of varieties of sheep. And you have these other animals that are... Uh, very similar like the ibex and also gazelles. You do have gazelles in, in Eretz Yisrael. And people are going to say, well, you know, it's kosher, and it is kosher. I mean, you're, you're allowed to eat an ibex if you know how to shek it, um, in theory. I mean, I don't know if it'd be any good, but in theory, you can eat it, right? And a gazelle, uh, in theory, you can eat that too, right? It, it's It's very similar to a goat. But when you're talking about doing the avoda, uh, you know, the Torah the Torah calls for the avoda to be from uh, behema. And, you know, a, a domestic goat is going to be a type of behema. And a wild goat is going to be, um, is not going to be, it's going to be chaya. So, in other words, not only in the dikduk, in the grammar, are you going to have an issue where it's going to be separated, but you, you might actually also have differences where Yes, maybe they could interbreed, and yes, maybe it could throw off offspring. But again, we're talking about something that comes from the divine plan. You, you know, as the Rambam's pointing out, that you know, part of the divine plan, you know, could be that, you know, it was it was made this way back in the in the creation. In other words, that this is how it was formed at the creation. You have in the creation a wild kind of goat that was being 
created. These are not goats that just escaped. This is a, you know, it's like a, really like a standalone species. And yes, you can crossbreed them. By the way, you can also crossbreed a tiger and a lion, but you wouldn't say that you know, it's a variety of one another. You wouldn't say that a lion is a variety of a tiger. They are different species. Yes, they're close enough uh, where they can breed just like a donkey and a horse, but uh, they are different species and you're not allowed to do it. Why? Because a donkey was created that way in the creation and a horse was created that way in the creation as different species. And, you know, you have a problem coming now and trying to crossbreed them. We're going to be getting into this as well, I mean, yes, you can crossbreed a wolf and a dog, and you know, genetically, uh, we can see that a wolf is genetically, uh, you know, close, but it's different. And you know, also, we can see that you know, a fox is genetically close to a dog, but it's it's different. And you know, in terms of usage for you know animals for the kabonis, you know, you can't bring a blemished animal. Could you bring you know a, a crossbred uh, you know dove? to to the uh, temple to do you know for the service no you can't can you bring a wild goat to go do the service no you can't you'd say yes it's a goat and it is a goat right but the point is that you know we're talking about animals that were created this way in the creation and you know it's not enough just that they you could crossbreed a hybrid um, you know the, the idea is that you know the dictook itself is very precise in representing that it has to be this domestic kind of animal. And again, that these domestic animals and the wild animals are going to be colliding with each other. And that's a big point. Now, the Gemara is going to start off talking about the wolf and the dog, and then the village dog and the fox, and that they're colliding with each other. But it doesn't state that the dog and the village dog are going to be colliding. So they're looking at, you know, perhaps maybe, you know, this pair and that pair, you know, might be okay. So the Gemara is going to try to figure that out. It's going to say, but a dog with a village dog are not kalim with each other. In other words, the Rambam uh, is going to be saying about this that the dog and the village dog are similar and it's evident uh, from their names. And you know, one would expect that they are permitted with each other. And if they were prohibited, the Mishnah would have listed it because uh, we see you know, a ruling that, you know, would be a greater novelty than the prohibition of a wolf and a dog or a village dog and a fox. And from the fact that the Mishnah does not prohibit the union of the dog with the village dog, we assume that this kind of union is going to be permitted. So the Gemara notes that uh, this conclusion is not universally accepted between the dog and the village dog. Again, um, if you're taking, you know, the, these pairs and these lists, of what's going to be forbidden with one another. Again, the wolf and the dog are forbidden with one another. The village dog and the fox are forbidden with one another. And again, it's trying to figure out, well, in reading this Mishnah, does that mean that the dog and the village dog are allowed with each other? So that is going to be the question. And the Gemara says, and this does not follow the opinion of Rabbi Meir, for Rabbi Meir uh, must hold that the dog and the village are climbed with each other. And it says, even though Rabbi Meir uh, said that a common dog is a species of behema. He agrees that a village dog is a species of haya. Again, it gets back to the diktuk. And the Gemara says, therefore, according to the opinion of Rabbi Meir, a common dog, which holds the the the, the title in the diktuk as a behema, and a village dog, which has the grammar of a haya, that they're going to be collime with each other. In other words, that a behemoth and a haya are always going to be collimed with each other. That's the idea. And that, you know, yeah, even though you could, you know, you could mix it and they could have uh, babies and children and things like that, you're not allowed to mate these two animals. Now, the Gemara is going to note that the Mishnah mentions only animals, not birds. What about the case of birds? And I was doing a little bit of research to look these up and by the way, a lot of these birds will be able to uh, make hybrids with one another. But again, you know, as we see here, the you know, you're not allowed to mix the horse and the mule. You're not allowed to mix the mule and the donkey. You're not allowed to mix the donkey and the wild donkey. In other words, that yes, even though you could make something that could have a, a, a child, and yes, even though that you know the child might even be viable and survive, uh, you're not allowed to do it. So, 
uh, we see, by the way, in the Midrashim, and there's a Gemara about it, that Ona was the first one to mix these things. And he, by the way, was uh, the product of, uh, the first, by the way, product of incest in the world. And then what did he go and do? Because he was created like this, he went and created uh, these, these crossbred animals. And then Hashem created the Haverbar, which is going to be this uh, crossbreed between a snake and a, uh, a type of toad. And it's very poisonous and it bit him and it killed him measure for measure. So in other words, that Hashem created this animal, this new animal, says the Midrashim, Midrash Rabbah, that uh, was created Dafka in response to Ona, you know, doing these hybrids and uh, measure for measure went and killed him with it, with something that was not created within the six days. So, you know, again, the, you know, the idea in all of this is that Hashem has mastery over the world and we're supposed to try to keep the world uh, in terms of taxonomy and flora and fauna uh, with relation to how things were created. We're not supposed to get into these Frankenstein monsters. And I think that's a big takeaway today in, in thinking about Kalayim. You know, there was a story by Mary Shelley called Frankenstein's Monster. And it's the idea of when people think that they are in charge and that they are above science and that they make science and that they can do whatever they want with the natural world and that they can run things the way they want. And the story of Frankenstein's monster is that it goes horribly wrong, that you've created this monster that you can't control and you've created this monster that won't listen to the creator anymore and it will run amok. And that's really the worry about Kalayim even in today, that you're going to be creating these monsters that run amok, whether you're going to be creating these new species of uh, grain crops that have never existed before, that were not created in the creation. Then you have hundreds of millions of people relying on it. And if you have a, a failure from something that was not part of the creation, it's not part of the system of the environment, that it, you now have you know, a very high risk in your society because you have hundreds of millions of people of relying on this thing that never existed before, created in a laboratory. And, you know, you might have a real, uh, a real tragedy that occurs. And also now you have the potential of new diseases occurring because now they are taking embryos from one animal and mixing them with embryos of other animals. And, you know, now they're trying to create these things called chimeras that have, um, you know, actual mixtures of different animals within one another. This is not how it was created. And when, as we're seeing now with corona, uh, you know, that you know, perhaps, you know, you can get these new germs and new diseases growing in new ways, in ways that nobody can control, nobody can contain, and nobody can predict. And that is the danger. It might be a warning in the Torah not to do this stuff because there could be an impending uh, plague or tragedy or famine with mankind, humanity coming and trying to tinker with nature and coming and trying to be above uh, the natural world and thinking that they are in control of it. Again, you cannot build a wall to keep God out of the world and then coming and denying God and saying that he did not create the natural world and that human beings can rewrite and retinker and remake the world in their imagination might harbor a lot of danger. We might be creating Frankenstein's monster. So we see here that anything with the different taxonomy of Behema and uh, Haya, according to Rabbi Meir, is always going to be forbidden with one another. What about the birds? And the Mishnah did not teach whether the birds are subject to the prohibition of Kalayim. And although this issue of Kalayim of birds is not mentioned in the Mishnah, it is going to be found in the Brisa. And Rabbi Yochanan says that I learned from it from a Brisa by Bar Delia. Bar Delia, by the way, is going to be the name of the sage that shows up in the Tesefeta 1.5 and others in, in the in the Yershami Baba Kama identify that as from the House of Levi. But anyway, here it's referred to as the sage Bar Delia. Rabbi Yochanan says that he learned from the Brisa by him that the chicken and the pheasant, a chicken with a peafowl, although they're similar to each other, they are collined with each other. I was checking out by the way, what is a peafowl? That's going to be a type of peacock. 
So yes, could you mix a chicken and a peacock? Well, they're going to be climbing with each other. What about a chicken and a pheasant? Yes, chickens and pheasants do hybridize. You can create offspring from it. But when you look at the pheasant, it really does look different from a chicken. And even though you could crossbreed something from it, it is climbing with one another. You're not allowed to do it. Now, there's a question, and the Rambam, by the way, says that the non-Jews are also included in this prohibition on Kalayim, that the non-Jews are not supposed to be doing it, although that is a Malokit with the Roshonim and also going to be a Malokit uh, from the Tanayim, whether that's going to encompass uh, the non-Jews or not. I think you can find that in the Bavli and Sanhedrin when it's talking about the obligations of the Jews and non-Jews. So anyway... The, Rabbi Yochanan is going to be saying that the laws of Kalayim apply to birds. And Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish asks why Rabbi Yochanan did not cite a Mishnah as the source. And Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish said that Rebbe taught us in a full-fledged Mishnah in Baba Kama that birds are subject to the laws of Kalayim. And the Mishnah now is going to elaborate several halachot, including the prohibition of Kalayim that apply to domesticated animals. And it concludes, it says, Likewise, wild animals and birds are like domesticated animals. In other words, and by the way, if you look at the Latin name of the chicken, it's Gallus Gallus Domesticanus, right? It literally has the word domesticated in the, you know, the Latin name. So again, it's saying like the animals, like the birds, you're going to have a subset that's going to be the domesticated ones, and you're going to have a subset that's going to be the wild ones, and they are colliding with one another. By the way, there are physical differences. For instance, like in the domestic goose and the wild goose, uh, for the male, the testicles are different. In, in one, the testicles will be inside the animal, and on the other, the testicles will be outside of the animal. So there are sometimes anatomical differences, and... Uh, the Gemara says in regard to these laws, the mission is stating clearly that the Kalayim prohibition extends over to birds. So really what this is wondering is why is it that Rabbi Yochanan doesn't prove it from the Mishnah? He goes and he proves it from a Brisa by Bartaliah. So to answer the question, the Gemara is going to explain that Rabbi Yochanan is citing Bartaliah's Brisa because it adds something to the Mishnah from Baba Kama that was just quoted. And so by the way of example, the Gemara first shows that our Mishnah in Kalayim also expands on the Mishnah from Baba Kama. That's really going to be the Hiddish here. So the Gemara says, Rabbi Yonah said, there is a need for that Baraisa cited by Rabbi Yochanan. And we learned in the Mishnah there in Baba Kama that the Kalayim prohibition applies to wild beasts. And our Mishnah here is specifying which of the wild beasts are forbidden. And we learned in the Mishnah there that the Kalayim prohibition applies to domesticated animals. And our Mishnah here specifies which of the domesticated animals are forbidden. The Gemara continues, says, Likewise, the Mishnah there, Baba Kama, uh, says, teaches that the Kalayim prohibition applies with birds. And then Bardaliah comes here in this Barisa and specifies uh, here, which is going to be uh, forbidden with one another, like the chicken and the pheasant. So really what this is doing, Rabbi Yonah is pointing out the difference between our Mishnah here and the Mishnah over there in Baba Kama. Baba Kama is giving a broad um, theological point to say that uh, domestic animals and wild animals are going to be prohibited with one another. That's the broad point. And as Rabbi Yonah is pointing out here, this mission is giving the lists, the lists of which of these uh, domesticated animals and uh, wild animals are forbidden. And then Rabbi Yochanan is bringing the Baraisa, which has that list. So that's going to be the reason. Now, the Gemara is going to be giving a different reason why Rabbi Yochanan is bringing Bartaliah's uh, Baraisa and not uh, talking about the Mishnah from Baba Kama. The Gemara says that Rabbi Yose says that it was right for Rabbi Yochanan to quite to quote this Brisa because it comes to teach you that birds are subject to the prohibition of mating. In other words, what the Mishnah from Baba Kama is proving is only that birds are subject to the prohibition of leading. But Bartaliah's Brisa is needed to teach you that the prohibition of mating is also forbidden. Now, uh, there's going to be something where 
uh, the Vilna Gon is going to be saying that the Mishnah of Baba Kama mentions only Kalayim without specifying uh, either of the two Kalayim prohibitions, like leading and mating. So, you know, you can't lead two animals together. You can't lead a donkey and a horse together. Um, you can't lead an ox and a donkey together. It's considered cruel. By the way, considered Kalayim. Well, one of the other ones is going to be mating. So uh, here it might deal only with the prohibition against leading and leading the two animals. However, uh, what they're showing now is, no, it's actually talking about the mating. And that uh, we're talking specifically in this mission about mating horses and donkeys or mules with one another. Now, the Gemara is going to talk about crossbreeding of creatures of the sea. And what about crossbreeding creatures of the sea? Now, Rabbi Yermia says, Kana, this is going to be Rav Kana in the Bavli, Kana asks Rish Lakish the following question. Kana, by the way, was also one of the star students of Rabbi Yochanan, and asks Rish Lakish and says, if, by the way, Yershami, by the way, often calls him Kana, just, just to note that. But we're talking about Rav Kana in the Bavli, Kana here, oftentimes in the Yershami Shas, just Kana, same person. Anyway, Rav, Rav Kana asks Rish Lakish if, one mates marine creatures of different species. What is the law? And Rish Lakish answers to him. And he says to Kana that regarding marine creatures too, it is written uh, lemin echem, which is according to their kinds. And that's teaching that they are subject to this prohibition. In other words, when we see in Bereshit, in the beginning of Bereshit, uh, all aquatic creatures, including creatures of the sea, are created according to their kind. And it is written elsewhere that God created every cre every type of wild and domestic animal according to its kind. In other words, open up Bereshit. It says every kind of wild and domestic animal, right? So right in the beginning of Bereshit, we're seeing uh, in the creation a domestic version and a wild version. That's going to be part of the idea of why they're going to be climbing with each other. And just as you have a wild and domestic animal that's going to be subject to Kalayim. Uh, basically, Rabbi uh, Rish Lakish's point is going to be that sea creatures are also referred to as according to its kind, and that's going to make it subject to Kalayim. So the Gemara is going to quote a different version of this dialogue between Rish Lakish and Kahana. And in contrast to this version, uh, Rish Lakish is going to respond with a question raised by Kana. And the following version has Rish Lakish making a statement that then gets changed by Kana. So uh, this version doesn't go as well for Rish Lakish. Anyway, Rabbi Acha did not say so in this Gemara, namely that the dialogue between Kana and Rish Lakish went as reported. In other words, uh, that's, that's the way, one way it was reported. But Rabbi Acha is saying it didn't go that way. And rather, Rabbi Acha said, would say in the name of Rish Lakish, the prohibition of Kalayim applies to any creatures concerning that which is written uh, uh, Leminehu, according to its kind. In other words, anywhere in uh, the story of Bereshit, uh, where it's written uh, according to its kind, that's going to be something that's going to be a red light that indicates us that these things can become Kalayim with one another. So Kana then rep replies back, and Kana asks, and he says, but regarding fish in the sea, it is also written according to its kinds. It's also written uh, lemenechem, which is according to the kinds. So the Gemara is basically saying now the prohibition of Kalayim applies to fish. And Kana is basically saying it does not apply to fish. And basically, Kana is refuting Rish Lakish's rule that the prohibition of Kalayim applies to creatures about which it is written in Bereshit, where it's written according to their kind. In other words, uh, Kana is contesting that that is a basis for determining Kalayim. And, you know, it would make sense, right? Like, according to its kind, it should be with Kalayim with one another. And, and Kana is pointing out that, no, we see that according to fish, fish are not going to be Kalayim with one another. And it is written according to its kind, and therefore that's not going to be a proof, according to Kana. Now, the Gemara is going to comment, and Rabbi Yossi, son of Rabbi Bun, says here, Kana spread his net over Rish Lakish and caught him. In other words, he basically debunked uh, Rish Lakish's answer. And the Pnei Moshe says that he raised a difficulty with Rish Lakish's teaching 
and Rishakish was unable to answer him back. And the Gemara now is going to defend Rishakish. Rabbi Yonah says that I can interpret Rishakish's statement as referring to the prohibition of leading two species of animals together as opposed to the prohibition of mating. And again, when we go back to looking at uh, in Baba Kama over there, we're talking about two things. We're talking about leading and we're also talking about mating because both are kalayim. Again, we have five things that are going to be kalayim. One of them is going to be leading two animals together like the ox and the donkey. So what about leading two fish together and leading two species of animals together? So maybe it's talking about that instead of talking about mating the two animals. So then you have to ask your same, you know, same question that the Gemara is going to be asking, well, how is it possible for a person to lead two fish? Okay, I can understand that you tie, tie up to a plow a donkey and an ox. I, I get that. But how would you lead two fish? So the Gemara says, for example, one brings a cord and ties it to the ear of the Lakisa and to the ear of the Yerika. By the way, nobody knows what uh, specific two fish this would be. Uh, that's what the Mofortian are saying. And it says, and he leads them, and they swim together one with the other. Why would they be doing that? Uh, perhaps uh, they're trying to uh, they're trying to uh, breed them. You know, the fish can uh, rub up against each other and stimulate each other in order to uh, to do uh, breeding. Now, uh, Rish Lakish is saying that you know, with the laws of Kalayim, it's going to apply to any creature with regard to where it says according to the kind. And uh, perhaps now it looks like he could be talking about, you know, this is really a prohibition of leading animals, not mating. And that the prohibition indeed applies even to all aquatic animals, including fish. And, you know, the prohibition of mating, by the way, is going to be limited to aquatic creatures that mate through physical contact, like dolphins and whales. And by the way, dolphins and whales can hybridize. You can get uh, in nature, you can get uh, hybrids between them. You can also get hybrids between killer whales and whales or killer whales and dolphins that can occur as well, and porpoises and things like that. So the question is, you know, uh, what about for the sea animals? And, you know, according to the Mara Fulda, Khan is objecting to Rish Lakish's statement about arguing for all aquatic creatures and uh, basically is saying that, you know, you know, fish and others are, are not going to be subject to the prohibition of mating. But the Gemara comes back to defend Rish Lakish and says that there's going to be two versions of the Gemara's text. And one of it's going to be reading um, that you're interpreting it uh, not as a prohibition of mating, but as a prohibition of leading. And that's why it's talking about bringing the cord and tying it to the ear of this kind of fish and that kind of fish and trying to get them to rub against each other. And why would that be? They're trying to crossbreed uh, a kind of uh, fish because some of the animals, the fish, will uh, stimulate each other by rubbing up against each other to get them to, uh, to emit the eggs and the seed. So according to this version, there could be, in fact, some aquatic creatures that can mate through physical contact. And, you know, Rish Lakish, you know, is still understood as referring to the prohibition of mating. But in terms of the aquatic creatures, um, you know, it's going to be limiting those that could only make through physical contact. So a uh, little bit vague on, you know, which exactly it would be. And, um, you know, again, part of the idea, though, is that when we're getting away from the sea creatures and we're going back to, um, you know, more easily recognizable things like, you know, the wolf and the dog, that, you know, they are climbed with one another, even though they could make an offspring. Uh, and again, you know, when you look in Bereshit, uh, in Bereshit itself, it's talking about Hashem creating the domestic and wild animals according to the kind. And again, the idea is that this is an implicit part of the creation, and we should leave it alone. We shouldn't be tampering with these things. And, you know, again, this might be a warning to today's society and civilization that is trying to tamper uh, between different species of animals to create new things. And maybe there's limits that we should not be crossing. Have a great day.